Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, I'm Ron Glanville. I'm one of the former chief veterinary officers attending this event. Uh, the event's been organised by uh, in association with the Vets for Climate Action. And we warmly welcome you all to this afternoon's uh, session with Mark Howden. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we're all, all our participants are located today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, guys, today we are honoured to have Professor Mark Howden with us. He's the Director of Climate, the Climate Change Institute with Australian National University. He's an honorary professor at Melbourne University. He's worked in climate for over 27 years and has over 39 publications. He's been vice chair of the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore and other IPCC participants. Uh, Mark, uh, attending today, we have quite an august group uh, from the veterinary profession to listen to you. We've got uh, Jeanette Castles, Chair of Veterinarians for Climate Action, as well as its CEO, Ben Cox, and some other members uh, of uh, Vets for Climate Action, particularly from the board. But also amongst us, um, we should have uh, Dr. Mark Shipp, who's our current Chief Veterinary Officer, and also President of the World Health Organization, Animal Health Organization, the OIE. We also have a number of other current and former CVOs, um, university vet school deans, Julie Strauss from the Australasian Vet Boards Council, as well as some board members. We've got Warwick Vale, our AVA president, Australian Veterinary Association president, Steve Pryor, president of the Veterinary Business Group, um, the president of the Australian Vet Nurses Council, and finally the CEO of Lippard Australia. I thank everyone for attending. Uh, as a group, I think we all understand that climate change is a serious threat, not only to people, but also to our animals, uh, and in particular wildlife and livestock. Um, I also think it's fair to say that as our detail, that our detailed knowledge of this field is, is a bit variable as we're starting to form as a group, and um, we've got a lot more to learn. So therefore, we really appreciate um, Mark for taking the time today to talk to us. So in terms of today's um, agenda, we understand that, Mark, you're going to talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, the session will be recorded, so uh, people who can't attend today will be able to listen later. Um, so for the first 30 minutes, please remain on mute uh, for, the, for that time and then we'll open up the field for questions. Uh, while we're, uh, Mark's talking, also feel free to put questions into the chat um, uh, section of your, of your screen. Uh, there's al already in the chat session, there's a, uh, an instruction as to how to change your name against your, uh, uh, your little window where you appear yourself. Uh, thanks again for taking the time to talk to us today, Mark, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Fantastic. Okay, so I'll just um, share my screen. Um, so I'll just do the deed and um, so, share and hopefully hopefully that's um, showing up as a full screen slide yes it is excellent okay so um so um thanks rob and ben and jeanette for the opportunity to to present today and to to ask a series of questions afterwards and so what i'll do is, is give a quick run through about sort of climate change climate change issues and uh, and because I was met, I was told that um, uh, you know there was a, a as Rob put it a variable sort of understanding. I'll, I'll pretty much start from the beginning um, and then work through some of the implications that you might be interested in, without trying to go into detail in terms of the direct implications for different types of animals of, um, that may apply to you. So, and and what I'm doing in this presentation, I'll start out with what's already happened. Um, in terms of our change in climate, and then a little bit about what might happen in the future. So a bit sort of backward looking and a little bit about forward looking perspectives. <clears throat> so, so in just getting the slides up, so the, the fundamental driver of, of what we think of as, as human caused climate change is greenhouse gases. Um, so this is a, a graph of the biggest greenhouse gas um, source. Uh, this is fossil fuel based um, greenhouse gases, are, and this is looking at carbon dioxide. And in this graph, you can see going back to 1990, we were producing around about 22 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. 
Um, currently, we're sitting around about 37 billion tonnes and we keep on going up. Um, so last year, there was a 0.6% increase. Um, the previous year, it was um, about 2.5%. So um, in spite of the fact that we've got uh, really quite significant uh, international agreements, like the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and Australia is a signatory to that, uh, we're actually not doing what we said we'd do, which is actually turn the corner and start reducing our greenhouse emissions. And, and one sort of perspective on this is, is uh, um, you know, be, because it's a difficult call. You know, greenhouse gases are an integral part of the um, economy and society that we live in. So one of the things we've seen, though, is that um, because of the coronavirus and the lockdown, we've actually seen a little decrease, or what we're you know, projecting to be a little decrease over the whole year um, in terms of those greenhouse emissions. Um, and so on that same graph, that little dashed line at the end is uh, what we're projecting to be the reduction in um, emissions this uh, calendar year. And, and as you can see, whilst it's not insignificant, 7% uh, reduction is more than we've ever seen before in, in a single year, um, uh, it's actually relatively small compared with the big picture. And so if you look back um, at the global financial crisis on this graph, you can see what the GFC did. Um, it reduced emissions um, by about a couple of percent um, in that particular year, 2008, 2009. Um, but within a couple of years, we'd effectively bounced back to where we were before, where we were, where we were heading. And, and that's one of the challenges ahead of us. Do we sort of end up in a bounce back, sort of snap back sort of scenario where we go back to our merry ways of producing lots of greenhouse gas emissions, or do we keep the momentum of reductions um, and move that forward? And, and to put that in perspective, is that the sorts of emission reductions we're likely to see this calendar year, about 7%, um, are what we'd need year on year for the next couple of decades to actually achieve the Paris Agreement goals. And so, so that's the sort of scale of change that um, is needed to turn the climate change ship around. And to give you a bit of a, a feel in the longer term and the evolutionary history of many species that we're dealing with, um, this is a graph which shows carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. So this is from ice cores going back a long way and obviously more recently um, direct measurements. But we can see through this um, graph that over that almost a million year time frame, uh, we, we get ups and downs in terms of carbon dioxide concentration. So this is largely in the absence of human influence because humans have been around roughly 200,000 years, but not sufficient numbers to influence the climate until around about the Industrial Revolution. And what you can see is the ups are the interglacials, so they're the warm parts in our history, the downs are the glaciations, the cold parts of our history, and you can see in this graph that the um, between the glaciations and the interglacials, there's effectively a natural cap and a natural base to those greenhouse gas emission uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. So the cap is around about um, 280 parts per million and the base is around 180 parts per million. So there's essentially you can think of it as an envelope of concentrations which carbon dioxide naturally um, varies up. So there's feedbacks which restrict it from going up too much or going down too much. And what you can see on that graph is the 2020 observed number. So right now we're running at about 417 parts per million and we're heading up towards the top of that graph at the moment to about 900 parts per million. So that's essentially business as usual if you think of it like that. And and so the, one of the key messages from this talk is that if anyone says to you, um, this has all happened before, it's all part of natural cycles. Well, there is a natural cycle, that's the glaciation interglacial cycle, but we're grossly outside of that natural cycle already, and we're heading even further outside of that. And to put this change and the rapidity of change in perspective, when I was born, the greenhouse gas concentration, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere was 100 parts per million less than it is today. And so that's all happened essentially within one lifetime. So that's the, the rate of change that we're seeing. And we've known for a, 
about 170 years that if you warm the uh, if you put carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will warm the earth so this was known about in the 1820s um, it was first measured in the 1850s it was first modeled in the 1890s so this is not new science we've known about how greenhouse gases affect the radiative balance now, how much energy comes in from the sun and how much energy goes out into space for a long, long time. So unsurprisingly, given we've been pumping out greenhouse gases in the sort of billions of tonnes uh, sort of numbers for quite some time, um, it's not, not surprising we've seen a warming of the earth. So temperature globally is already up 1 to 1.1 degree, depending on your temperature record and the baseline you use. Um, and, and that clearly has been driven by human influence. So this is a graph that came out of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Uh, and what this shows is that the blue line is the best estimate of what would have happened to our temperatures in the absence of human influence on greenhouse gas emissions and land use change. The orange line is the best estimate. And, and you can see that blue line is essentially flatlining. The little dips are largely caused by volcanic activity. The orange line is the best estimate of human influence on temperatures through greenhouse gas emissions and things like land use change and uh, carbon, you know, black carbon in the atmosphere, similar things. And the red line is the combination of the two, the combination of best estimate natural plus best estimate human, um, and that gives you the red line. And you can see that that very closely follows the actual measurements over the last 150 or so years, which is the squiggly line in the background. And if we actually look at where temperatures are going up, they're going up faster over land than they are over the ocean. So over land, it's gone up about 1.5 degrees, uh, over the ocean, less than one on average. At current rates of change and expectations, we actually may get to 1.5 degrees globally which is the lower of the Paris Agreement's two targets, as soon as 2026 or 2028. And as I mentioned before, there's almost zero chance that what we're seeing is not due to human influence. And just to give this a slightly different perspective, because a lot of the time we focus on uh, the average temperature change, and to put those average temperature changes, what sound like small numbers are actually really significant. So, you know, we're talking about one degree already of warming and maybe heading three, four, five or six degrees, which doesn't sound like a lot on a day to day basis. But the last ice age was around about five degrees Celsius cooler than our historical temperatures. So when we're talking like two degrees, like that's or two and a half degrees, that's like a half an ice age in terms of temperature change, but just in the other direction. So what this graph shows is it, it starts to disentangle um, the average temperatures from what's going on in terms of temperature variability at lo different locations. And of course, this is what influences humans. You know, that's, the, that's what we feel and it influences our um, animals, our livestock and natural um, biodiversity. And, and so what I'll just show is the, the temperatures over the last hundred or so years, but using a different way of expressing it. So what this shows is every little dot down the bottom is the temperature compared with normal at each site across the earth. So each of these little dots, tiny little dots down the bottom is a different location on the earth. So the ones north or upwards of this black line are towards the North Pole, the ones downwards are towards the South Pole. So they're arranged in latitudinal um, location. And what this shows is in this case for the year 1900, what each of the temperatures were at each of those sites compare with the long-term average for that site. So we can see that there were some places which were about two degrees colder, and there were some places which were about two degrees hotter than the long-term average in the year 1900. So if you think about that, the temperature range between pretty much the coldest place and pretty much the hottest place was around about four degrees in at the year 1900. Now I'll play this animation and you can see how this has evolved over time um, and the radical nature of the change that we've already seen due to human influence.
it's not animating for us. Isn't it? So you're not seeing a moving diagram? No, we're seeing your notes page. I don't know how that happens. Um, so you didn't, can you see a, a, a change in the graph at this point? If, no, we can't. If okay. I may, Mark, we're seeing the PowerPoint slide. So if you're using dual screens, we might actually be looking at the wrong screen. Well, okay. <coughs> on my screen, it's showing a, a, the uh, graph at the bottom. Right. Okay. Um, don't know what's going on there. So I can, I can, um, I can try that again. Um, do you see something moving now? Yes. Okay. Yep. So what you should see now is is a, a different sort of figure from what it started. And and this figure um, shows shows the sorts of changes we've already seen. So um, so one obvious thing is that the average temperature, the sort of the peak has moved um, upwards, so it's getting warmer. And so that's your average temperature change. But the really important thing in this graph is the change in the variability of temperatures. So so if you look down the bottom of that, um, you should be able to see that um, in a lot of places, you're getting temperatures up to around about five degrees hotter, um, or sometimes even more, than the long-term average for that location. Um, but we're also getting some places which are three degrees colder than the long-term average for those locations. So the range of temperatures, the, the variability, um, has actually almost doubled. So the range between three and five, which is eight degrees minus three and five, um, is double what it was in the year 1900, which was around about four degrees. And it's that temperature extremes which tend to impact heavily on uh, on you know livestock and you know domesticated animals, etc. And so um, so that's the that's one of the really important things is that it's actually the the extremes which are changing most significantly. And, and I'll just move again. So I'll just see if we can sort out this slide issue. Um, and uh, so are you still seeing a slide which has click to add notes down the bottom? Yes, and, and your uh, preview of uh, slides down the side. Okay, I'll just see if I can fix that up in a, a, just now and, um, and get yeah that's sorted out. Um, uh, stop share and I'll go on to full screen and uh, So does that show the full screen version now? Yes, thank you. Okay, yes. right, yeah. I'll, I'll keep running with that then. So, um, so this is this is what uh, it looks like for Australia, um, whereas previously I was focusing on the global picture. And you can see in Australia, um, temperatures are increasing just like they are globally. Last year was our hottest year on record, um, uh, with um, one and one and a half degrees above the bureau's baseline, which is a very recent baseline. It's not the same as the Paris Agreement pre-industrial baseline. Um, we had last year the hottest summer. We had heat waves in several months. We we broke our record in terms of average temperature across Australia on two successive days, and we almost broke it on the third day as well. And and so we're seeing this really significant change in Australia's temperatures, and again very closely linked to human influence on uh, via greenhouse gas emissions. And and it's not just again, those average temperatures, it's the extreme nature of the temperatures which we're experiencing. So this is a, a graph which just shows the proportion of any given place, in this case, the Murray-Darling Basin, which is experiencing what used to be thought of as extreme temperature conditions. 
And so what this shows is if you go back, say, in the 1940s, essentially nowhere um, in Australia in the Murray-Darling Basin was experiencing what would be thought of as an extremely hot year. Whereas what we've seen over the last handful of years is that everywhere in the Murray-Darling Basin is experiencing what would have been considered in the past to be an extremely hot year. So what were extremes in the past are now normal across big slabs of Australia. And again, that's the things that impact most heavily on animals. Um, but it's not just emphasizing that thing. It's not just about the hot extremes. It's also about the cold extremes. And so without going into any particular detail, this is actually what's also happening in terms of frost in southeastern and southwestern Australia. So frost is actually getting worse. So that those sort of cold extremes, which also impact on animals, are getting worse. So what this graph shows is essentially this little, the little um, triangle in the middle is a, a sort of a, a, an estimation or an illustration of frost risk in a given environment. In this case, it's out at Wagga, west of Canberra. And, and so this is the 1950s picture. This is the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and near 2000s. And so what this shows is it's not just that the hot extremes are getting worse in these sorts of places, but also the cold extremes are also getting worse in these places. And so, so it's that, that variability which is actually increasing, not just the average temperature. And it's not just about temperatures. Uh, so we're seeing rainfall change um, across significant parts of Australia. Um, this is what happened last year. Uh, so it was the worst um, year on record for rainfall, um, with the exception of, you can see in the northwest, where we had a big tropical cyclone that came through, and that's where we had that disastrous uh, event with, uh, you know, up to about half a million cattle dying of cold um, because of that and deluge. So they had very little feed because of the previous drought, um, and, and when the, the rain came in with that tropical cyclone, they they suffered really badly, um, so their energy balance couldn't keep up, and so there was mass deaths in that region. But for everywhere else in Australia, um, with the exception of another tropical cyclone over in the northwest, uh, that it was bone dry, and lowest on record across big parts of Australia. And and if we remember going back a year, towns and rivers were running dry. We had the massive fish kills in the Mar um, the Darling, um, but we also as rains and severe floods in some places. So that extreme nature, which we've always had in Australia, is just getting more extreme. We had both the hottest and the driest um, year on record, but we also had cold events which killed large numbers of animals. And in various parts of Australia, we've seen really significant drying trends. So this is for Southwest WA, where they've effectively lost around about 20% of their uh, effective rainfall um, already. Um, in uh, the last few decades. And that combination of high temperatures and lower rainfall um, is generating drought conditions in Australia as it is in many other places, but not everywhere across the globe. And you can see from this particular study that the southeast of um, Australia and the southwest are those areas which are most affected to date with increased drought impacts. And of course, that relates to animal welfare issues. Just to sort of give a, a quick snapshot of what this looks like in terms of our operational environment, this is a graph that I produced for some farmers um, a couple of months ago. And what this shows is the relationship between rainfall and temperature in a given year. Um, so this is for Southern Australia, and this is for the years pre-1950. So each of these dots is a year in Southern Australia. And what this shows is a relationship between those years which are wetter years, which have higher rainfall, are also colder years. Those which are years which are drier years are also hotter years. And there's good reason why this should be. You know, um, uh, dry years have very clear skies. You get um, increased sunshine. There's less evaporative cooling because there's no water around. Um, and that's why it gets hotter. So that's the 1950s picture. And you can see there's a, a, a relationship between that and I've just put a sort of a, a, a little ellipse around those to sort of give you a feel for the envelope of which we're operating in terms of rainfall and temperature pre-1950s. This is what happens if you split it up to pre-1950s, which is the top left, 
1950 year 2000 in the top right and then the years after 2000 in the bottom in the red ellipse and so you can see that that relationship between wet years and colder years versus hot years and dry years is very robust across those different periods so there's effectively no change in the slope but what that shows is that when you combine those is that those years which we've experienced since the turn of the century have almost no overlap with the operating environment that existed pre-1950. The environment in which we're dealing, that combination of temperature and rainfall, is almost now outside of past experience. And so that means the sorts of things that we need to deal with in terms of you know, agriculture and, and you know, animal welfare have almost changed fundamentally. They're outside of that envelope of previous experience. And of course, fires are part of that picture. Um, and what we've seen across um, South Australia and particularly Southeastern Australia is the fire season extended. Um, has, is so, you know, it's coming earlier and finishing later. Um, fire intensity and frequency have increased. The number of days of higher fire danger have increased because of hotter and drier conditions and the affected area has increased. So this graph comes out of a very recent paper from just a couple of weeks ago. It was published from David Lindenmeyer which shows the area in Victoria, which was burnt, um, and 2020 was um, the, um, already um, is the worst year on record. Um, and that's without fires that might occur um, later in this year. So as well as those things which are the increased risk, our opportunities to do controlled burning have actually reduced. Um, so because of the extension of the fire season, the period in which we can do control burning has reduced. So, so our ability to manage the risk has reduced as well. And this is happening already. This is not a future scenario. This is already happening. And sea level is rising um, and rising quickly. Um, so it's more than linearly. So it's accelerating over time. Uh, and this particular graph just shows the different components of sea level rise. And two things that I want to um, focus on here is that if you go back to the start of this graph, 1993, the sea level was rising around about 2.2 millimetres per year. It's now rising at 3.6 millimetres per year. And going back to 1993, it was contributing 5%. Now, Greenland, the breakdown of the Greenland ice sheet was contributing 5% of the, the sea level rise. In 2013, it was contributing a quarter, and now it's contributing well over a third of global sea level rise. So the most recent results from last year. And so, so what we're seeing is a very rapid breakdown in the Greenland ice sheet, much, much quicker than anyone was predicting as little as 10 years ago. And Greenland by itself has around about seven meters of sea level rise. And so if you get continued breakdown of Greenland, um, that's going to radically change the environment around our coasts and impacting on all sorts of different ecosystems and animals. And those changes that we're seeing in the oceans are not limited to what's going on in terms of sea level rise, but also we've seen big changes in our ocean currents. And I know that this probably isn't um, a big issue for veterinarians, um, but what we're seeing on, in the oceans also matches what we're seeing on land. So in this particular case, the East Australian current, um, which in the past times has sort of come down to Sydney or Jarvis Bay latitudes before heading over to sort of New Zealand, um, is now stretching down to Tasmanian latitudes and further, even further south than Tasmania. And that's bringing warm water down to those latitudes which haven't been experienced for several thousand years. And that of course is bringing a whole stack of uh, um, animals with it, such as you know, um, problematic uh, urchins, problematic um, diseases, which is impacting on the ecosystems down there. And the same sorts of things are happening on land as well. And tropical cyclones globally, in terms of numbers, are increasing. That's the top left-hand um, panel. But really importantly, um, they're, they're both extending further north in the northern hemisphere and extending further south in the southern hemisphere. So that extension is almost 400 kilometers now. Um, and the damage associated with cyclones is getting worse and worse. So we're getting more and more of the category three, four, and five cyclones um, proportionately, and they're the ones which have higher wind speeds, and they're the ones which cause, cause more damage. 
And a recent paper actually showed that this was highly unlikely to happen, except in the human, uh, due to the human influence of climate change. And so this is a real concern, again, because these really severe cyclones are what damage ecosystems, damage humans, damage livestock. So the last few slides are just focusing on the future um, and looking at uh, where we're going in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. So the left-hand side of this slide is what I showed you the first slides, which was what we've actually produced already in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, going up to about 30 something billion tons a year. And if we keep on going on our current trajectory, we sort of head into this sort of red line zone which takes us to a world with three, four, five, or maybe even six degrees. So that's effectively our current trajectory. If every country on earth did what they say they'd do under the Paris Agreement, so our existing Paris Agreement commitments to reduce emissions, so Australia's commitment is 26 to 28% below 2005 levels, um, this is where we'd land, um, a change of around about two, three, three and a half degrees. To actually achieve the Paris Agreement goals, which are to keep temperatures well below two degrees, or if possible to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, we've got to go onto the blue trajectory or the dotted line here. And you can see that there's an absolutely massive difference between where we're heading and where we need to head to limit climate change. And that's going to be one of, you know, already recognized as one of the big challenges ahead of us. Now, what does this mean in terms of global temperatures? Well, at the moment, we're heading towards the bottom right, um, the, you know, the bottom panels, which are a world which has very high emissions and high temperatures. If we get our act together, we head towards the top panels. So relatively modest um, temperature change down to around about two degrees. But at the moment, we're heading down towards this scenario. And what that shows is by the end of this century, um, we might get temperatures around, particularly around the, the Arctic, the, the northern latitudes, which may be 9, 10 or 11 degrees higher than their long-term average. And, and this is terrifying. So that's like twice an ice age difference in temperatures, but again, just in the other direction. And, and we might think that's extreme, but we heard only last week that in Siberia, they're experiencing temperatures which are 18 degrees above their long-term average. And, and in terms of these temperatures, it was only a couple of years ago that the global seed bank in Svalbard in northern um, Norway actually flooded. So this is a, a seed bank which is stuck up in the, in the Arctic, way up in the Arctic Circle amidst all, all the ice. It was supposed to be frozen forever. And so that's how it was keeping the seeds, the global seeds of you know wheat and corn and maize and sorghum, etc. And that flooded. And that was because the temperatures were way beyond anything, any scenario um, that they'd used when designing that building. So these are not extreme. These are sorts of temperatures, which even though they're the extreme 2100 projections are already being realized in some years right now. So what does that mean in terms of things like heat stress for animals and, and humans as well? So this is work that I actually did last century, um, 1999. Um, but it's still very pertinent. So what this showed is that in the top left is a graph of historical frequency of heat stress days. So if you go to the top end around Darwin, about 70% of days are heat stress days. Around Canberra, around about 10% of days are heat stress days. So this is a combination of temperature and humidity. Under a 2.7 degree scenario, which is sort of where we're heading with our current Paris Agreement targets or commitments, um, what you see is that across roughly the top third of Australia, almost every day becomes a heat stress day. And those conditions which are currently experienced in the tropics, like places like Rockhampton, will stretch right down the continent to cover um, places like Canberra. And I've lived in Rockhampton for a short while and I know the difference between a rocky environment or a Townsville environment where I lived for three years and Canberra, it's a huge difference. And these are the sorts of changes in heat stress that happen with what sounds like a relatively modest temperature increase. And lastly, I just um, a quick comment on water because water is so critical to everything that goes on in Australia. And 
And what we're already seeing is big changes in terms of runoff in Southwest WA and also in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, and, and so this is a scenario which mo most closely matches those changes um, from the IPCC. That's a report from a couple of years ago. And what this shows is runoff change per degree warming. So if you look at the Murray-Darling Basin, so 15 to 20% reduction in runoff per degree, so if we're dealing with, say, a three degree scenario, which is sort of where we're heading at the moment, um, that you multiply these numbers by three. So it's between a 45 and 60% reduction in runoff in the Murray-Darling Basin. So if we think we've already started to see conflicts and competition in the MDB between different water users, so urban use versus industrial use versus agriculture versus environment, we ain't seen nothing yet. And, and I think this is going to have huge implications for what goes on in our landscapes across Australia. And, uh, and you know, we heard just today about the, the threats associated with um, koalas um, in New South Wales, but you toss in um, these sorts of extreme hot temperatures, reductions in runoff um, and increased drought, and what looks to be a bad situation becomes a lot worse, a lot quicker. So, and the last slide is just on fire risk. So we've known, you know, we've just experienced a horrendous season, of course, and, and it's on in front of mind for a lot of people still. Um, and we've known for a long time that fire danger is a function of drought, which dries out the, the fuel, so it, it's easier to ignite, um, and also results in leaf drop in our forests. So, so you get leaf dropping from the trees with drought, and that builds up your fuel load. We all, it's also a function of high temperatures. So if you get a really hot day, um, obviously it's much easier for the fire both to ignite and also to spread. Um, strong winds are crucial in terms of our big fires um, and they're strongly related to what goes on in terms of our pressure system, our cold fronts. And those are also linked to climate change. So they're likely, those sorts of fire conditions we saw at New Year's are likely to happen four times more likely under climate change scenarios. And lastly, the dryness of the air, how dry the air is, the relative humidity. And unfortunately, that's actually getting drier over time and it's been projected to actually get drier in the future. So the four key drivers of fire danger that we see in South Southeast Australia are all likely to get worse with climate change. So we need to be really aware that the sort of risk we're seeing are probably just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to managing our systems. Thanks very much.